All right. Thank you. So you're the reason that I'm here tonight. And since I value your time, my goal at the end of the talk is that you look something like this. Uh, taxed, breathing heavy, uh, a little tired out. Um, why would I want that? Because of this book. Uh, <clears throat> read it if you haven't. Your users will thank you. Your future self will thank you. So uh, talks are not a good way to learn. Uh, much like running, the, the benefit actually comes from the preparation that you did before, the rest and nutrition, and then the response to your body afterwards. So I don't expect you to take, uh, as I'm talking along, all this and incorporate it, but at the end, I'm hoping that you'll think about it and put it together um, in a way that you will benefit. So I'm not going to give you a nice, nice roadmap ahead of time. We're going to just start running. So why is learning important? That S is all about learning. Why is learning important? Because experts consistently make better choices. So Henry Ford introduced the moving assembly line in 1913. The time to produce an automobile went from 12 hours to 2.5 hours. The same materials, the same people, the same processes, basically a five time increase in the uh, speed with which you could build the car. And that introduces our first information property, that the value of information is in using it to choose a better alternative. But information takes time to propagate. There is both uh, distance and resistance to new information. The, uh, the assembly line itself was actually introduced by Ransom Eli Olds approximately 12 years before, 1901. So it took time before Henry Ford actually uh, introduced it and started um, <coughs> benefiting from it. Since it takes time for information to propagate, the information that is distributed in the system is non-uniform. Uh, much like these students who are learning uh, to play uh, orchestra instruments, they're going to learn at different rates, and maybe a student wasn't there one day, so they introduced the information that student didn't, didn't actually hear about, it, hear about it. So in Dan Rome's uh, excellent book, Show and Tell, uh, about presentations, he presents four different ways that your audience may change from your presentation. The first is that you can present new information, so that information changes. The second is that you can help them acquire a new skill, sort of stair-stepping up their ability. The third is that you may um, convince them to take a different action. And the fourth is that you can change their belief, or what he identifies as the heart. And these are arranged from uh, what takes the least amount of effort to change to the greatest amount of effort. So <clears throat> applying information implies change. We don't get something um, from applying information. If it, if it didn't change anything, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be information. It wouldn't be, there, there wouldn't be any value of it. It's like a chair sitting there doesn't change. Uh, because it implies change, change requires work, and work implies cost. Is this image of a young woman or an old woman? Yes, good answer. Uh, you can't see my, my corner. So it, it depends on your perspective, right? There's a young woman in that image. All of the lines on the display are exactly the same, but <clears throat> depending on your perspective, you either see a young woman or an old woman. Information can be inconsistent. That inconsistency implies a contradiction. The value of information is in choosing the better alternative. Do I choose A, do I choose B? Um, one piece of information may say choose A, another piece of information may say choose B. The thing that I, that I think is very interesting in, in this image of Kitsa is that the, um, the contradiction of the inconsistency may very much not be some sort of external property of um, correctness, but uh, part of our interaction with the system. So the, the, the image uh, is a young woman or a woman, depending on your um, 
perspective, you cannot uh, easily say that one is correct or not. So many, many years ago, in the early 1900s, and actually even earlier in the 1800s, we had electric vehicles. The information that was available to produce this electric vehicle um, was sufficient to produce a vehicle of that uh, quality at that time, a complete vehicle function. And today we have a company that is producing thermal electric vehicles. The, the amount of information to completely produce uh, one of these vehicles is very different than the amount of information used to produce the earlier vehicle, but the information is still complete. So, uh, now over time, the, the leverage that we get from information, how much we can actually um, do with it, uh, uh, will, will degrade. So as, uni as information becomes uniformly distributed, it no longer gives you uh, leverage. So when Henry Ford introduced the moving assembly line, that uh, increase in efficiency of building vehicles allowed them to have a competitive advantage in the market as the other car manufacturers introduced it. That uh, competitive advantage became a cost of doing business. And now today, no one could introduce, um, could you know, become a car manufacturer without using the moving assembly line. They wouldn't be able to compete. So the fundamental problem with working uh, with information is, uh, sorry, the fundamental problem with working with matter is coordination. Coordination required um, based on the properties of matter. So, whoa, you know what? Brand new battery, should not do this. Okay, uh, sit on my cute puppets. So properties of matter, uh, of matter. So one of the key properties of matter is that it can't be in two places at once. So your, your, your keys are not going to be at the door when you need to leave, and they're actually in the cushions of your couch. And no matter how much these little puppies try, uh, two uh, uh, pieces of, of uh, matter cannot occupy the same place at the same time. <laughs> there is also no action at a distance. I'm sorry, but it is not real. You need to get the material, say, from the, the steel mill to the factory to, to build the car. And the order of operations is uh, critical. So if you put your clothes in the dryer and then put them in the washer, the result that you're going to get from that is probably not what you want. Which leads me to wonder, is information uh, and matter different, or are they, are they fundamentally different or the same? You may have heard this before. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, and practice there is. <laughs> You may have also heard this idea that, um, you may have heard somebody say something that uh, that's too theoretical. So the interesting thing about theory is when you hear theory, I want you to substitute this idea of explanation. A theory is nothing more than an explanation. And there are properties of this, uh, this idea of theory or explanation. And I want to look at, look at them. There's four of them. The first one is that there's some sort of phenomenon out there that we observe. Um, we either see it directly or we use some uh, instrument like a microscope or a telescope or something else. And then there's a model of the world that we construct. It's not the world, it's a model of the world. And especially of this very important relationship, this cause and effect relationship. And then there's this critical element. Is our model uh, accurate? Does it actually tell us something about cause and effect that gives us leverage on the situation? So there are three important properties of a good explanation. The first is that it allows us to make a prediction about that cause and effect relationship so that we can get something from it. And then it must be possible to use evidence to falsify a prediction that that model makes. And very importantly, it needs, the explanation itself needs to be hard to vary. If we get contradictory information and we just change our explanation to accommodate it, that is not a good explanation. So a good explanation needs to be very hard to vary. Now, in looking at the accuracy of our, our explanation of theory, um, we could talk about it. Philosophy has a long history. But there is a particular tool that we can use that is very powerful, and it's something that um, I think that we should use a whole lot more, 
but it tends to scare people away. So we're going to run through real quick. If you ever heard the words formal system and thought, oh my god, that must be math or something like that, I'm going to run away, I want to invite you in. We're going to just run through four really simple properties of this definition. So the first is that there is a finite set of symbols. Just think after that, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then there's a grammar for constructing something called a well-formed formula. And there's a set of axioms that are just well-formed formulas that are accepted. There's nothing that, 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 um, that justifies them. We just say they exist. And then finally, there's just a set of these rules to go from one well-formed formula to another. Now, that, that set of inference rules, that not from well-formed formulas, one together may preserve some property like correctness, whatever correctness means, in that system. But it's just that, it's just a set of rules. So formal systems are not terrifying things that we need to run away from. They're actually pretty simple. We can use natural language. We have grammar already to go with our language. We take some things and we say these are axioms, and then we can work out a set of inference rules to say, how do we get from this to this? And this overall talk, looking at the properties of information and the properties of matter, is a motivation to look at something like an actual theory about how we use information and question whether we can get a good explanation about out of that that offers us leverage okay, in working with information. So just like the definition of a formal system, I'm going to, I'm going to offer a definition of microservices. So in my definition of microservices, we have a network of communicating services which perform computation. This is a system definition. You can't take one part of this out. Right? So this definition is like your live frog, right? eating flies, if you kill it, and pin it to the table to dissect it, like try to take a computation process out of its definition. That's the dead frog. So we want to stay with the live frog, the system definition. Now, what I've represented is just an arbitrary graph. Right? So A, B, C, D, E are uh, services, and then the, the, the connection between the nodes is the network, and it implies communication. Now there's four properties that I'm going to add to this definition. The first one is substitutability. Now, the idea of substitutability is that with the least amount of cost to the system, I can substitute the communication that was going from C to A to C to A prime without disturbing anything else in the system. The second is replaceability. I can then remove A from the system and be left only with A prime. Now all the communication is going to A. So the idea is that A prime represents better information, A represents old information. We've migrated the system forward, now the system is more consistent. This property of isolation, a lot of definitions of microservices introduce this idea of um, an auto a, a autonomy, some sort of autonomous service. But that is fundamentally contradictory um, in relation to my definition of a system uh, that is a network of communicating processes. None of those processes have anything like autonomy um, because they, they must participate in that um, network to have any um, existence, really. So we can't deal with one independent of the rest of the system. I like the idea of isolation a lot better. I think it's motivated by properties of information. Isolation is the idea that um, behind the communication with A, nothing is visible to the network. So what happens in A is only visible via communication. That's the same for every service in the network. And then finally, this idea of repeating structure. Because, uh, partially because of isolation property, A might actually be an entire subgraph. Uh, and to everybody that's talking to A, they think it's a single service. So you can zoom in on a service, and you can see another uh, subgraph, or you can zoom out of a subgraph and see only a service. 
So my hypothesis is that microservices are a universal and optimal mechanism for working with information. Essentially, that microservices are the assembly line for working with information. So assembly lines are used to solve the problem of coordination. Microservices are used to solve the uh, fundamental problem of information, which going back to the first property is uh, use to choose a better alternative. The fundamental problem of information is access to relevant information at the time that you're making a decision. So universal and optimal are not arbitrary choices there. Universal because it can be used for any time that we're working with information. And optimal because there's no uh, mechanism that can provide a lower cost way to work with information without being equivalent to it. So that's my hypothesis. I'm not going to argue that I'm right, but I want you to use this framework of this talk to think about it in those, in those terms. Now, what, what about the, so we have this mechanism to use um, in manufacturing, right? We're, we're moving in some line. What about the processes that we use? So we use three processes, and they're everywhere, uh, also in uh, the way we construct software. And that's something that I really want you to think about. So the first is status. Where is it? Stand-ups, status meetings um, under the guise of all kinds of things. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's that thing? Hey, when are you going to be done with that? Hey, right? So status is everywhere around us. Now, status in manufacturing is really important because a piece of matter uh, doesn't compute information. It can't tell you anything about where it's at. And when I need to know are the materials getting to the factory, are they going to be there at the right time? Am I not going to get two shipments when I only have a place for one? Status is really, really important. So when we work with um, matter and manufacturing, we need status. The second is testing. Um, will it work? Because we need to know this ahead of time, otherwise the cost is enormous. If I have two parts that have to work together, I absolutely need to know before I manufacture them that they're going to work together. So testing is critical. Now, testing is also used everywhere when we construct software. But the question is, is it critical or is it even possible to know ahead of time, uh, will it work? That works on my machine. Um, and then when we deploy it out into the world, does, it, does knowing that it worked before we deployed it have any uh, correlation to knowing it will work after we deploy it? And then finally, delivered. Is it done yet? Um, since uh, matter has this um, very different property of information where uh, we can, uh, information is fractal, we can use differing amounts of it to complete a task, I can't deliver you a useful half of a car. I have to deliver you the entire car. Or say a table. A table doesn't become a table with you know, two thirds of the top missing. It's not done yet. So delivery is absolutely essential when we're working with matter, but not when we're working with information. We can deliver parts of something. Um, for example, the Tesla car comes with hardware on it that isn't enabled yet, and then they um, update the software, and, uh, and, and then that component works. Or we can deliver uh, five features behind a feature flag, and when the user logs in, we choose one of them, right? This sort of thing. So we can, we can actually deliver partial um, functionality with information uh, much more effectively than Now, if we, you know, we've got this mechanism moving the assembly line, and we've got the processes, the status testing and delivery. Now, if we're working with information, um, I propose that we have this mechanism of microservices, and uh, what about the processes? This is interesting because, um, you know, going back to the fundamental problem of working with information, which is access to relevant information at the time of making a decision, I don't think that it's possible to prescribe a certain set of processes. What I think instead is that we have an ongoing constraint problem that we need to solve. And that constraint problem has three elements. The first is batch size. This is how much information that we, um, how much we force to be combined into a group to move through our process. And the second is cycle time, which is the time that it takes to go through one iteration of our process. And then uh, the third uh, constraint is quality of feedback loops. 
And this is something that we can test. We can look at where decisions are made in our process, and we can say, what was the quality of the information that we had available at the time that that decision needs to be made? This is something that we would have to monitor over time. We have to see, um, I made this decision, I have this outcome, I made this decision, what information was coming into that, making that decision, and what the, the consequence was going out. So going back to this, uh, this woman, the, oh, this, sorry, this picture of, of the woman, whether it's in or the, the change in perspective, right, which I think is possibly an audience change that Dan Rome didn't talk about in his book, this change in perspective can be very powerful. Now, as I noted, the woman here is young or old, depending on your perspective. And I don't think that the way we work with information versus the way we work with matter is um, entirely arbitrary and just something of perspective. But what I think is important to consider is that right now the perspective is that when we construct software, we should use all the successes that we have from manufacturing. So uh, every sort of process that you may have heard about or experienced, from waterfall to agile to scrum to scrum bond to stuff from lean startup, when I look at them, what I see is many attempts to solve the problem of coordination, and very few, uh, with the possible exception of Kanban, to solve the problem of access to relevant information at the time the decision is made. So in presenting this idea that perspective may be important, again, I don't think that it, um, I don't think that it's true that you can just say it's my perspective that microservices are good, or it's my perspective that assembly lines are good. I think that the properties of data and the properties of information dictate that. But I think it's interesting to consider from the, from the, the, the idea of perspective, why we all seem to be doing things to solve problems of matter and manufacturing even when we're actually uh, working with information. So <coughs> learning means retention. And uh, a lot of the new information um, in the last, say, 10 years has identified that it's not repetition that uh, results in retention, but actually retrieval. And so um, as you go away, think about the problems that you've dealt with this week, today, this month, uh, where they are. Are they using status testing and delivery? Are they? Um, are there properties of uh, information that I have suggested that, that may be relevant? And what sort of outcomes are we getting uh, in the way we're doing this? And um, going back to the book, uh, the, the um, Bad House, now it's your turn to take this stuff uh, and go make the people that use your work Bad House. Thank you. So, real quick, uh, I printed out a bunch of little postcards. Uh, there's a bit.ly link on there. The bit.ly link is uh, probably memorable. Make a note of it if you want to access that link. Uh, probably not. You know what? Sorry. I have a pen. Boy, like, how do I write on this thing? So, there's two questions on there. There's, there's actually more. That are intended to, um, you know, get to your deepest, darkest thoughts. No, seriously, be, be brutally honest. Your, uh, your, your feedback and your um, unique uh, perspective uh, from what you've experienced uh, I would be very grateful if you can just take a moment to fill those out. Um, and uh, if you want more information, don't write information on that because I, I don't want any like, email addresses or anything because I need mean, so to like, respect your GDPR. So there's a double opt-in <laughs> email uh, sign-up link that you can send me your email if you're interested. Um, so with that out of the way, now that we're all distracted, any uh, questions, Brian? I 
was just going to ask, um, what's your background with microservices or manufacturing processes? Uh, so I've been constructing software for uh, a long time, since the mid 80s. Uh, I have not worked in heavy uh, manufacturing. So this is a good question, and you know, you notice that I didn't start with, uh, you know, this is my name, and this is a little bit about me, and this is what I've done. Um, if you crack open a physics book, you know, it's not going to be Newton's physics book versus uh, Galileo's physics book or something like that. Right? Science uh, it doesn't matter who is teaching you the science. If science is valid, it's a good explanation. It follows those properties that I described. It's good information. One of the things that I see a lot that really concerns me in our industry is uh, Netflix is doing this, or Microsoft is doing that. And, um, and one of the things that motivated a couple months ago uh, my um, focus on this was looking at everything that I could find about microservices and not finding uh, a ton of agreement. People from Martin Fowler to Sam Newman, who wrote a fantastic book, Early Microservices, um, offer sort of um, something similar to a natural history of microservices or something like that. And that uh, perplexes me because uh, if what we're doing actually just reduces to whether somebody popular enough said it's a good idea to do it, um, what does that sound like? Okay? It doesn't sound like science to me. Now, what I want us to be doing is science. So, um, so I, I haven't said, oh, hey, you know, I built this fancy thing. Now, <clears throat> what I think is interesting is if you go and you look at the evolution of some of the microservices talks from Netflix, and you try to understand uh, things that they've learned, uh, I think there's a lot of value there. One of the things that I, I saw recently was they were talking about how they had introduced an API gateway, and their API gateway could um, run arbitrary scripts, which sounds like an awesome thing. And uh, of course, they like Ruby scripts, and everybody knows that Ruby is one of the most performant languages on the planet. So um, the API gateway started by kind of tipping over when someone would deploy this new script, and so they said, oh, that's not working well. So we're going to pull that stuff back to this other set of little services that sort of um, are, are decoupled from the API gateway. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, because why in the world would you start creating this component, like an API gateway, that started to not have that property of replaceability? Right? Um, and so what I, what I think is that if you take some of these, um, not some, but take the, the definition of properties and go look at the systems that people are constructing and say, does this uh, follow these uh, properties and this definition, or does it deviate? If it follows it, what does that imply and what sort of things can we observe from that? And if it deviates from it, what does that imply? There's another thing that I'll, that I'll tell you about you can go look at. So people are starting to talk about important <coughs> so let me back up just a second. So one of the big problems in microservices, and one of the, the one of the errors that people make is to couple data behind multiple services. And um, it really doesn't matter how often you say don't do this, it's bad to just all do it. And uh, so the current incarnation of that is that hey, it's a problem, we have this problem with data. Um, let's not depend on any of these databases, let's just imagine an entire stream of data flowing through. We'll just materialize views from that stream for particular services, right? And then uh, we won't have this problem of this, you know, this service over here needs a little bit of this data, but then this service needs a little bit of that data. They can't share databases on all to do. So what happens though when you introduce this stream of data with these materialized views, right? That's gotta be and uh, what happens when you have a volume or scale uh, problem, one of those dimensions that you need to deal with. Do you have replaceability and substitutability? And if the answer is no, what's the consequence for your system? So that's a great question, and I, I appreciate you asking it because it's one of the points that I'm trying to make here. If we don't approach this with some sort of science, if we're not looking for a theory that is a good explanation for the phenomena that we see and gives us leverage on the cause and effect relationships that we want, what are we doing? So, I think it's a really interesting idea because instead of saying like, like, like oh, yeah, yeah. okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I would just say I think it's a really interesting idea if instead of saying like, uh, A, there's a system, how can we iterate on it and improve on it, it's saying here are the properties that we're dealing with, what is the best possible system that we can kind of abstract out of or extract from it. Um, I think that's really cool. I, I think where I'm struggling is kind of like, what does that mean in practical terms? If I'm saying, hey, a microservices approach is the best approach for dealing with information, um, how do I make sure I don't totally fuck it up? You know, I mean, Absolutely. like, th there's like a lot of complexity and issues like that. Um, you know, are, are, there, are there practical tips for us? Absolutely. So, <clears throat> when you look out, you know, just outside, one of the things that we see is roads are really common. And while we re resurface them or expand them and we, you know, widen them or we add, you know, new high-speed fiber underneath, the basic structure of a road is, is quite unchanged. It's a basic piece of infrastructure that's really important that solves this problem of mobility between two points at a low cost. And uh, we don't see uh, a lot of innovation in those. They're there and they're useful. And you know, maybe we'll see them surfaced in something that is you know, solar cells or, or something like that. But, but the basic concept is that if you look at microservices, the exact opposite is true. Everyone thinks that they're building their own version of microservices. And um, because of the fact that they think about them as that one service and not the network of communicating processes, um, an opportunity to build fundamental infrastructure um, is, uh, is lost. And so uh, to answer your question, Tim, yes, uh, <clears throat> there are some practical suggestions. One is um, we have tools now, like Terraform, that can uh, automate, can allow us to describe and code in an in a entirely uniform way how to do things like creating a process. And uh, I don't go into it here because, again, I'm really wanting you to think about the properties of information, the properties of this definition. But um, I'll have more content soon. There, there is very much a particular architecture that I think is essential to be able to meet these properties. And that architecture, uh, if you look at uh, one of the recent web, uh, webinars that Nginx has done, um, is, is starting to develop out there. And uh, the basic idea is that every single service, remember this is a logical definition, it's much like a virtual machine that runs on top of a physical computer. So uh, every service, which is a logical entity, uh, will have a reverse proxy. And talking to that service is talking to that reverse proxy. And that reverse proxy may be layered. It may have one or may have a high degree. HAIP, high delivery IP that is that is um, that is uh, multiplexing traffic coming into this logical IP. But essentially, every single service will have a reverse proxy, and every single service will handle auto scaling automatically. This is something that we can actually very easily build into um, every major infrastructure provider. So DigitalOcean, Azure, Google Compute, and, uh, and AWS. Right? Those are the big four. Um, and so uh, we use a little bit of discipline to program a process that represents the service, and we deploy it, and the infrastructure should take care of everything else. So a lot of times we hear people talk about uh, microservices being useful to handle scale. What they mean is volume of traffic or uh, volume of requests per second. But that problem of scale is really one of multiple multiple dimensions of problems that you may have in the system. And uh, again, going back to what I was saying about optimal and universal, I think that this structure allows us to deal with any one of those problems, scale, any one of them, in a way, if we, if we, if we actually build that thing that I'm talking about. And underneath that thing is you know, stuff like this idea of a service. Um, it must, since, since the property of isolation is there, and that repeating structure, I must be able to talk to A as if I'm only talking to A. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that arbitrarily, right, is to scale the processes behind A that are pro pro um, providing this, um, this communication with this logical answer to the service. 
so I think that there is, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And, and again, um, nothing that actually presented to you here, with the exception of maybe the definition of microservices, is my own ideas, my own thinking. This is all stuff that is out there. Uh, people talking about it, writing about it, uh, and, and uh, you know, you can pick up a book on that uh, logic, tell you a ton about formal systems. Um, there's actually some other links I'll add if you visit that, the Vinius Microservices link. Um, there's a famous um, physicist by the name of uh, Peter Deutsch, who's uh, very influential in early quantum computing, some of the first quantum algorithms were created by him. He's got a, um, a great talk about what makes a good explanation. And that's where we get that idea of that hard to vary stuff. So, um, yeah, I think that on both dimensions, the, 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 the sort of the theory and explanation based on the, the practical, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there if we, if we, if we, want, to, if we want to do it. And, and again, if we, if we draw back a little bit from this idea of you know, microservices are for scale or so and so, like Netflix said they're a good idea, and I want to do Netflix, therefore I'm going to use microservices. I actually think that they're an ideal structure and mechanism for the earliest um, stages of building something. Because think about it, what do we, what do we have in the early stage? In the early stage, we have a high degree of inconsistent information. Right? By necessity, we don't know enough about that domain yet to have a lot of consistent information. Not uniform, highly inconsistent. What is the lowest cost way I can start to leverage the information I think is correct without perturbing the system or without putting a lot of effort into building the system? Right? So, does that help? Any other questions? Does anybody fundamentally disagree with what I'm saying? Like, that makes no sense. Nobody. Does anybody say, tomorrow I'm going to go out and start learning about my shit? Maybe. All right. Is there anything else I can help you with? No? Let's grab a beer. Yeah.